Yate, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are at, for all of those joining us online for part two of Artists and Their Residents, a New Mexico Historic Sites National Park Service National Endowment of the Arts program. Talking about me as an artist. As many of you know, I'm a weaver and I'm part of the Navajo Nation, and I've been showing you bits and pieces of my process and my history uh, leading up to this weaving right here, um, which right now is tentatively named We Exist, um, a testament to the transfer of weaving knowledge over the past uh, several generations, a few thousand years, and I will cover history, some oral tradition, and just a disclaimer that this is the knowledge that I've accumulated that make me understand my existence, my family's existence. It is not the de facto authority because as you will see in my presentation we are a wonderful mixture of oral tradition histories kingship clanship uh, cultures and technology that span as much that we are that makes us human and we will go over that in several slides and uh in my history. My previous experience with Bosque Redondo Memorial Museum was actually a collaboration with uh, a Boy Scout member, um, Zeke Arganez, um, wanting to create a donation for the museum. So I collaborated with him and he did the fundraising so I could gather the materials to create a woman's dress that looked and felt like the weavings that you see pictured in a very tragic uh, portion of my people's history, the Navajo Long Walk, the internment at Bosque Redondo. This happened in the mid 19th century. Um, and Navajo history is very complicated uh, because there are several authorities that contradict each other um, but this is what I know and mainly the pressure uh, from settlement starting in the 15th century and several clanships wanting their own style of leadership and their own response to that created fractures and schisms within a once united people in the place that we call Deneta, uh, an area that could have been there as early as the 13th century um, and had individuals living there up until the, the Mexican colonial period. This is We Exist and as I said it's a testament to weaving technology of the least the last 2,000 years, a story that involves gender conflict, gender resolution, gender inequality, gender equality, and weaving seems to come to a forefront whenever there is great societal change, whether it's growth, collapse, and in even a sign of when things are getting too good in either direction, whether it's on a decline. So in a sense, weaving is always a litmus test of a society's health. Uh, you can put it in ones of like capitalism. How do we treat people who make our textiles versus how much we exchange to wear another person's work? In most indigenous cultures, uh, it's supposed to be equivalent exchange. What you give is what you take. and both parties leave amicably. Um, in cultures where either or gets too much power and one has to give up power, those signs are actually documented within the weaving. And we may, you know, uh, touch on that a little bit. And that's why this weaving is so special. Um, because it's probably taboo from certain clans, um, depending if you're a male or female, um, what tribe you belong to. But at the same time, it seemingly has this ability to, to advocate for interconnectedness.
So it all begins with the land and landmarks, mountains in this time period because of their animals, their mineral source and plants become important markers. And groups of ancestors move in and they establish the trail system that still follows most modern roads and water sources. And this leads to travel and development as communities spring up along these natural, uh, we could say, ancient freeways. And then stories of different cultures and groups that is shared among different peoples in the Southwest happen. Uh, journeys to the South, uh, war against men and women, and the working class and the elites come into conflict. And this sets up pretty much all the different clan stories that is unique to every culture, and they know some context more than others. And this is what I understand within the Mud Clan. Somewhere around the 10th century, matrilineal power coalesces in Chaco Canyon and creates this symbol. And this is the height of their power. They both use radial and diamond tool tapestry. And then within a few hundred years, men come into power in the same area. And then the weaving starts this kind of migration as the conflict between the genders uh, continues to get more complicated. And this is the, the men moving into the north. And you can see what was previous matrilineal type weaving elements start to spread out along the areas. And then a new set of culture takes over. And this is in the Mesa Verde region, uh, plain white cotton with paint. And then that one drives the last big conflict between men and women, uh, the bear woman against the snake clan. But the piece that results after this conflict creates the most complicated and delicate diamond twill tapestry ever created. And this is a recreation from a textile fragment that is around the 13th, 14th century. And within the next hundred years, all the old centers of power start shifting south. And as older styles start coalescing among what would become historic tribal groups in those areas. And this is where there's more evidence to support Navajos as our current culture starts to coalesce in this area and weaving in its current form starts to be acculturated into our culture. And this is the final version, which is pretty much the historic techniques found in those cultures by the time the Spanish arrive. So one of the problems I had with the warp was its hairiness and a tendency to unravel. So after looking at any of the possible ways to be able to make a locally sourced sizing, I settled on hominy rinses, uh, the dissolved cellulose in the process of nixmalization of corn. Um, it's a slight plastic and you process this enough, you get cornstarch. So it seemed like a viable option since I used this recipe to starch my shirt collars, uh, French cuffs and shirts. Um, I added a little bit of fat to it um, in order to make it more um, plastic so that it would resist flaking while it was on the loom. So this was just one of those methods where I had to find a local version of something that is done um, worldwide. Once that was solved, I was able to count the twill and this is your standard four heddle stick setup for this diamond twill. So I've counted off the center, counting to the sides and I'm finishing each uh, size of the heddles. Normally what I would do is I would hand pick the four counts that I would need and proof it and make any corrections before I even make in the heddles. 
So this brings us up to historic Navajo uh, from the Neta, about 17, um, 1700 on into the 1820s. These are all uh, pictures of textiles from that time period, um, including a horse cinch that is dated to the earliest 18th century. Well, thank you for joining me today, and I sure hope that you gain some experience that you will find valuable in your own lives. If you're a weaver, you're moved to learn new things and make it valuable for your own experience. And if you have traditions and teachings that your family holds, to decide to share that with your own family and others to keep this, this idea of weaving and, and history alive because that is how we grow in our existence. You don't just live and nothing is, is there to live on um, from my understanding in, in Navajo Salaf philosophy. Um, and you break that word down. It has um, like sa it, it, it means old, but in the sense of just lots of time, and it's ambiguous whether it means the future or the past. And there's root words to like when we say sani, sane, saze, all these things before me to there. Um, and there's a missing part between sant na yet, I, I believe, but na yet means the critical decisions that need to be made as the situation changes. So this is a lot of the the warrior mentality. We tend to think of it in, in negative connotations when we're at peace. But me as a mud clan, we tend to think of things sometimes the opposite. Like even the word peace is bad in certain sense in terms of colonization or conquest because who gives up their rights for the peace? And in the Mudland philosophy, that's an equality which leads to conflict. So it starts this whole build up to war essentially. So we tend to think about it, you have to acknowledge those feelings of inadequacy, inequality, in order to really come to terms with the idea of balanced. If you still call people your enemy, then you're still in conflict and your energy and the things you produce are going to reflect that and that can grow and create greater conflict. So I think that's a very, very powerful philosophy and that's only just half of that phrase, because um, through your it says kingship, but that idea is the idea that you're no, you're no longer a singular being. You're connected to other beings that you share common ancestry, a common DNA, a common culture, uh, that everything that brings family together is embedded in that. Uh, so your your <laughs> your family uh, those ideas of social structure that bring people to unite um, and you see how that that works with the previous part where you know you know critical decisions that need to be made uh, warrior mentality and then it ends with hojon um, it is the idea that everything exists within their own Kind of think of it like uh, Skittles. You know, they push back, they exist in a space, but they don't crush each other. They just kind of flow freely between each other. So you want that in community. And that's the driving principle of everything in my art. That I take stories that I've experienced, stories that I've heard, and stories that I see in other weavings, and I put it in a form so that individuals in this current time and age 
hear my theme almost like a language they hear what i experience and i think that's the main goal of every artist is that when people come to your art there's like a a sudden escape of your breath for a moment that you stop and you connect with it and i'm trying to do that between the extremes the now and the past and this weaving technically hasn't been woven and probably you know as far as i know 900 years there could be some out there that families are very secretive of um, but it's here now and it's being made by a living weaver that other people can look at this and see a familiar person of our past um, you know leading up to where it all came from and I think that experience is what I always shoot for in these lectures these residencies that the art itself connects with people so that when they leave especially in this very very tragic part of our history where we were ripped from the areas that we call home and put to an area that we didn't want to be uh, and then told that was our existence to come from that and then have those weavers and those men and women continue to survive so that we can walk 